So uh, thank you all very much for coming and have a very good day. Don't forget to visit the uh, final first. It's located here in the corner. I'm one of the friends of the Imperial. You don't have to visit the right place for this. Oh, there it goes. Okay, is he done talking? You're on. You ready? Okay, you ready? Here it's we go. Rolling. The most tumultuous year in one of the most tumultuous decades in American history, marked by unforgettable images etched in our collective memory of tragedies both at home and abroad as the Vietnam War tore this country apart, unseated a sitting president and gave another his unlikely comeback. But in the arts, it was a watershed because 1968 also saw the King's great comeback. The Beatles rode the wave of a revolution and charted their highest selling single. In film, Kubrick released his magnum opus, 2001 A Space Odyssey. And in comics, it was also a fantastic year. Maybe it's most fantastic because so many of the field's greatest artists did some of their greatest work on their greatest characters in the history of the media. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to 1968, the greatest year in the history of comics. And my name is Arlen Schumer. I did a book about comic book history in the 1960s, The Silver Age of Comic Guard. You can come to my table later and see it. It's a book about how the 1960s were reflected in the comic book art of the time. This is actually a spread in Esquire magazine in 1966, the first time a mainstream um, the first time a mainstream magazine featured a story about the rising ascendancy of Marvel Comics. And here's how I worked that into a spread in my book so you can see how comics in the 60s, especially Marvel, reflected the decade. Look at this spread and look at how Steve Ditko's Doctor Strange and his psychedelic visions were mirrored by what was happening in psychedelia. In fact, an interesting story, three years before the Beatles came to America, the first issue of the Fantastic Four was about to be published, but publisher Martin Goodman didn't like the title Fantastic Four. So he had Stan Lee change the title to the fa he wanted them to change the title to the Fabulous Four, but Stan Lee stuck with Fantastic Four. And had um, that not change not been made, they would have been the first Fab Four three years before the Beatles. So this is another spread of my book. And the thing about the Beatles is when you look at how Lennon McCartney revolutionized rock and roll in the 60s, you can also see how Kirby and Lee revolutionized comics in the 1960s with their partnership. Now when you look at the credits for those books, they usually read like this. Sometimes it said written by Stan Lee, drawn by Jack Kirby. Now I'm of the um, persuasion that believes that it was Kirby who created the characters and the stories of Marvel Comics, while Lee was the editor and the dialogue writer, but that's the subject for a whole nother lecture. Suffice it to say, the Marvel 60s were kicked off by the first issue of the Fantastic Four in 1961. And soon it became the springboard for all of the Marvel Universe characters that Kirby would bring back in the 60s with Lee. Look at how Kirby's art in just three years matured until you see the kind of mature Kirby style, those blocky, muscular figures. And it was in annuals like 
the Fantastic Four Annual 1965, in which Reed and Sue got married. And only Kirby could have done a cover like this, showing all the characters that he created for Marvel in the 60s. But there were some characters, when that cover appeared, he hadn't even created yet. And they were to be rolled out right after, in 1966. You had the Inhumans. Then you had Galactus and the Silver Surfer. These are all early 1966 creations. And then the Black Panther. There's Kirby around early 66, late 65, looking very proud in front of the comics that he spearheaded. And it was also this time that the Marvel Universe began to make that jump into multimedia. So you had the cartoons in the fall of 66, and all the merchandising. Now look at that Hulk figure, and how the Hulk figure also appears in the first newspaper article about Marvel Comics, about nine months before that Esquire piece. And it was this piece, Superheroes with Super Problems, that really laid the groundwork that Stan Lee was the creator of all those things, not Jack Kirby. So Jack Kirby felt that he had to create these things to keep Marvel afloat, but other ideas that he wanted to give to Marvel in the later 60s, he decided not to. And some of those characters, we'll see a little later, like this character, Ryan of the New Gods. But when you look at what Kirby was doing in 1968, the year that we're discussing, he was still at the top of his game. And it was this annual, in 1968, that really was Kirby's last great Marvel work. Because it was the last work that he created new characters for Marvel that are still being used today. You have Annihilus. You have Kirby's artwork, which in 68 was still at its peak, in full pages like this, as well as double page spreads with his uh, classic collages. And then, of course, he gave us the birth of Franklin Richards, and these are characters that are still being used by Marvel today. And then in 68, in Kirby's other keynote book, Thor, he featured one of his greatest sagas about Mangog, who comes to destroy the universe. Now the name Mangog comes from the biblical descriptions of these twin evil gods named Gog and Magog. I think this is in the Apocryphal Bible, I'm not sure. But it was all about how in the future in Armageddon, the armies of Gog and Magog were going to come into the Middle East, into Israel, and this would be Armageddon, the final battle for the end of the world. Now Kirby, who fought with Pat in World War II, what do you think he was basing this on? Of course, it was the takeover by Nazi Germany in World War II, being led by Hitler, blitzkrieging all over the continent. So when you read this Mangog epic about this beast that's running roughshod over all of Asgard in order to bring on Ragnarok, you can see where Kirby got this idea from. Now Kirby in the pages of Thor for the previous couple years had been toying with this idea of Ragnarok and here is the splash page of a 1966 issue. And then five years later you get this splash page looking very similar. And that splash page is the splash page of New Gods 1 with the character we saw before, Orion, that appears in 1971. So these were the ideas that he brought to DC when he left in 1970. Now when you look at a guy riding through space on a kind of mechanical spacecraft there, of course you think of Kirby's great character, the Silver Surfer. But when we look at 1968, and what do we see? We see the Silver Surfer in his own comic, but yet, that's not drawn by Jack Kirby. Here is the house ad that Marvel Comics ran, and when we look closely, that's of course the art of the great John Buscema, who kind of was the Lou Gehrig to Kirby's Babe Ruth in the 60s. Now, he himself says he had no idea why Stan Lee chose him to draw the book versus Kirby, but this has a lot to do with the behind the scene issues of Kirby being unhappy at Marvel. But the most salient point for 1968 is when you look at Kirby's Silver Surfer, you see the classic bulky Kirby figure. But when you look at the Buscema Silver Surfer, he's much lithe and much thinner. And it's this version of the Silver Surfer that's actually entered the pop culture lexicon more when Joe Satriani 
did his um, album cover, that's more the Buscema Silver Surfer by way of John Byrne than it is the more majestic, bulkier Kirby Silver Surfer. And it's really the Buscema Silver Surfer that's the one that reached the screen 10 years ago this year um, versus the more bulkier Kirby Silver Surfer. Now this issue, even though it's dated February of 69, is the only issue of the 18 that I'm showing you today that's technically dated 69, but I thought it deserved inclusion because it actually came out. If you know how comic book covers are dated, they're always about three months in advance. So I feel this issue, which is everybody's favorite Silver Surfer issue, and I'll show you some of the artwork from it, actually came out in November of 68. So I feel it still qualifies as one of the great comics of 68. But you can see in what many consider Buscema's greatest Silver Surfer issue, the hints of the characters he would draw in the future for Marvel. If you look at this beautiful jungle scene in the animals, you can see why he was tapped to draw their Tarzan years later in the 70s. And then, when you look at this issue, and the fact that it co-starred Thor, giving Buscema a chance to draw Thor, then you'll know why he filled in for Kirby when Kirby left, and basically for the rest of his career, drew Thor for Marvel Comics. Now, Buscema's other major achievement in 1968 was being the lead artist on the Avengers and debuting the character, the Vision. Many Marvel fans' favorite Avenger. And once again, you can see the liveness of Buscema's figures, really beautiful, and inked by the great George Klein, former Kurt Swan inker over at DC. What's, what's really memorable about this, is, about this issue, when the Vision discovers kind of his humanity, look at that middle panel there. I thought this was very 1960s. Why Buscema decided to draw this, it's very reminiscent of the images that were happening in 1968 of psychedelia and the peace sign. And then, of course, you've got this full page spectacular image, one of Buscema's best, that everybody to this day remembers the idea of the vision crime. Now, it's very hard to pull off a man crime, it's very hard to pull off a superhero crime, and it's very hard to pull off a superhero robot crime, but Buscema did it. And that's why, when you look at Buscema's art book, that cover of the vision made it as his signature image. And it's an image that's been paid homage to by many great comic artists since, like Bruce Timm of Batman the Animated Series. Again, one of the keynote images of that series. Now, I bring up Batman precisely because in 1968, a major innovation happened with Batman in his team-up title, The Brave and the Bold. Now, what do we have here when we look at this cover? We've got this character, Dead Man. Now, who is Dead Man? Here's the house ad, lettered by the great Irish snap, and again, you can see that beautiful hand lettering, and this appears in late 1967, and it's drawn by the great DC artist Carmine Infantino. And right away, Dead Man looks different from every other DC comic superhero. In fact, he wasn't a superhero, he was just a trapeze artist who gets shot midway through one of his uh, feats of daring do. And when he lands on the ground, he discovers he's not dead and he's actually rising alive from the ground. Look at these great Carmen Infantino oddball panels. This is Dead Man now as a kind of a living ghost moving towards the light. And he goes outside and a tree starts talking to him and the tree is actually the Indian spirit Ramakrishna telling him that he's gonna let Dead Man live as a ghost so that he can find his killer. Now, the idea of reincarnation in Indian spirits was very much in the air in 1968, especially because in the early part of the year, the Beatles went to study with the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, Sekhti Zaidi, if you've gotten the recent White Album reissue. But there's the Beatles, and this was in the air, and Arnold Drake, the writer, was very hip to this. He was a kind of a beatnik hipster, Arnold Drake, who also created the Doom Patrol. So he decided that in order to compete with Marvel, DC needed to get hit. So he creates Dead Man by mixing these ideas of reincarnation and Indian spirituality with this idea of his killer having a hook 
Now, what makes this interesting for the 60s is that in the summer of 1967, when Drake was putting together the first issue of Dead Man with Carmen and Patino, the last episode of a four-year running series called The Fugitive came out, and at the time, it was all about David Jansen hunting down his killer, uh, the killer of his wife for four years, but he was a one-armed man. And that's where Arnold Drake got the idea of the book. By the way, in August of 67, this was the most watched television show at that point in television history. But right after Dead Man 1 comes out, Carmen Fantino, shown here, gets promoted by the head of DC Comics, Erwin Donenfeld, the son of the original founder, and becomes the art director and eventually the editorial director and the publisher of DC Comics. And he was charged with getting DC to compete with Marvel. And by bringing in new ideas and new artists, here's a house ad that Infantino illustrated that appears in late 67. And right around this time, a young artist happened to come into DC's offices named Neil Adams. And here is, very few pictures exist from this era. But Neil Adams came from a couple of non-comic book backgrounds. First of all, he was an expert in comics for advertising that use photographic reference to make people very realistic. And this is the background he would bring to comics in 1967. 